Ghost from the West. One. Philip Fox pulled the stolen army green truck into the rest area. It's one headlight bobbing as the truck rode over the loose gravel and shaking gently as Mr. Fox put the truck into park. Eric hopped out of the truck, his worn out black canvas shoes smashing some hopeful clover amongst the loose gray rocks. He looked into the blackness with a hand placed over his eyes as if to guard himself against the absent sun. He turned towards a beige mid-sized SUV and held his gaze there for a moment before making a puzzled frown and turning to Mr. Fox. I don't see anyone, Pip. You want me to, like, knock or... Shh! Mr. Fox held his face in a tight frown and shifted the truck into reverse, nearly taking Eric with him as he leaned into the window and readjusted the truck so that the lone headlight shone into the SUV. Shit! Mr. Fox put the truck back into park and stepped out, the treads of his dark work boots absorbing the loose gravel. <laughs> Eric sighed, put his hands on the back of his head and chewed on the left side of his lip thoughtlessly, his face barely caught in the shadow of the headlight. Mr. Fox scoured the horizon and paced the small area of the rest stop. As he stepped back into the headlight, a thunderous bang ripped through the relative quiet of the cicadas and croaking frogs. Eric's left hand wrenched violently backward along with the bottom of his eye and top of his jaw. Eric fell twisting to the ground. He lay contorted and strange. The viscera contrasted in the sparse light, a dark pool forming under his now destroyed head. Unthinking, Mr. Fox sprinted into the woods, faltering in the moonlight amongst the thick brush, but always moving. He began to slow, no longer guided by the recent crack of the gunshot, growing more uncertain in his bullish charge. Before he could process the second cacophonous bang, his left hand exploded in white-hot pain. Hastened now by a new adrenaline, he rushed towards the gunshot and brief muzzle flash. An enormous man in mismatched camo held the rifle, his face turning pale with fear as the bloodied and disheveled Mr. Fox barreled into him, knocking the rifle from his hands as he fell back, his spine smashing into a gnarled root. Before he could so much as let out a brief yelp from pain, Mr. Fox had grabbed the rifle by the barrel, and he brought it down upon the man's head as if he were chopping wood. Then he brought it down again, and again, and again, until the rifle butt hit nothing but a red ghost upon the decaying oak leaves and sparse grass. Mr. Fox's grunts echoed through the forest as he dragged the enormous man back towards the vehicles. He patted down the man for keys, but finding none, he broke the back window of the beige SUV with the butt of the rifle, reached in, and opened the back. With a great effort, he heaved the man into the SUV. He put his hands on his knees, breathing heavily, and spat onto the corpse before rising again. He began to walk back towards the truck, but stopped momentarily at Eric's disfigured corpse. He let himself, for just a moment, feel the pain of Eric's death. To feel the pain in his left hand and grieve the loss of his missing pinky and ring fingers. To grieve the fucking $10,000 he was supposed to be driving away from this deal with. He collected himself, went to the truck, and rifled through the glove box. He pulled out a wad of mismatched napkins, walked over to the SUV, and stuffed them into its gas tank, letting it sit at the end. He gently lifted Eric's body into the SUV and closed the hatch. He pulled a cheap plastic lighter out of his pocket, unsuccessfully sparking it a couple of times before holding his hand over the flame, which he brought to the wad of napkins, and lit. As soon as they caught, he pushed them into the gas tank and jogged back to the truck, its screeching tires preceding a disappointingly small boom as the truck's one headlight bobbed down Highway 33. 2. Ah, fuck, Richard muttered under his breath, finally backing away from the game machine on the counter. Don't know why you're trying, dude. Your luck hasn't exactly been awesome lately. Fuck off, Trevor. That's why I'm playing. I, I could use a win. Yeah, so no chance then? No, she said she's going in to file tomorrow. I'm, I don't know, man. I'm fucking over it. You definitely aren't. Not her, just all the drama. You know what she said? Richard sat back down at the table where Trevor was and took a long drink from a dark-colored beer. She said I was a coward, man. What the hell does that even mean? I'm not actually asking. She fucking told me. It's just, I feel like she's trying to be mean at this point. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Trevor sighed and looked down into his drink. It'll be okay, somehow. Yeah, I guess. Richard finished his drink and wiped his mouth with the back of his arm. Well, I gotta work tomorrow. I'm heading back home. You good, man? I can drive. I just had a light. I'm fine, dude. Richard walked out of the bar and pulled out his keys, wandering a bit before locating his red pickup. He climbed in and turned on the tape deck before putting the keys into his ignition. He only made it a couple of miles before he pulled off Highway 33 into a gas station to relieve himself. He opened the doors into two bright overhead lights to a strange man remarking loudly upon some of the products. Richard thought he looked homeless, or maybe drunk, probably both. Too many damn flavors, man. How is a person supposed to choose? They don't want us to think. Just grab, buy, consume. Richard shuffled quickly to the bathroom and shouldered open the stall door. It was nearly so disgusting that Richard turned back to find another option, but there was no other option. 
Richard sat down. He did his best to hold his breath. When Richard came out, the strange man seemed to be continuing his diatribe, but this time directly to the clerk at the counter. The attendant seemed a bit annoyed, but otherwise unperturbed by the harassment. Richard went over to the cooler and grabbed a six-pack of his favorite IPA. He went over to the counter where the disheveled man was still talking at the gas station clerk. He stepped into the line behind him loudly, hoping he would get the message, but the man continued unaffected. Hey man, can you... He thumbed off to the left. A bit so I can help that guy? Said Andy, the gas station clerk, in a tired voice. It's all bright colors and fruity flavors now, the strange man continued. He rubbed the two fingers of his left hand on his thumb. That's where the money is. It's not just to target the kids. It's to turn us back into fucking kids, man. It's more than just some nostalgia grab. They want to psychologically revert us back into children. Would you move, you crazy son of a bitch? Richard belted, finally losing his patience. Excuse me, said the man, sounding suddenly more sober. I, I said move, man, Richard said, a bit more uncertain. No, no, that's not what you said. Not only are you mean, now you're not even being honest. This is your fault, really. The strange man reached into his waistband and pulled out a semi-automatic pistol. He gestured with it dramatically. See, now, now I have to rob this place. Richard thought about his wife. He thought about being called a coward. He thought about reading his name in the paper. He did not think about his shit luck as he lunged towards the man, who deftly stepped aside. I ain't scared of some bum with a gun, Richard choked, puffing out his chest as he regained his balance. The man looked at Richard and rolled his eyes exaggeratedly. He then turned to the clerk, shrugged, and shot Richard in the head. Three. Andy woke up to the familiar shriek of his alarm clock. He clicked the small button down as violently as possible, then sat up, rubbed his eyes with his palms, and pushed himself out of the bed. He put on a pair of brown cargo pants, a high leather yellow shirt that said right landscaping, and a pair of relatively new work boots. You don't need to pack a lunch. Your dad says he'll take you today, his mother shouted as he pounded down the stairs. Thanks, Mom, Andy swiftly replied before rushing out the door, already verging on late. His father shook his head as Andy pulled in just before 8 o'clock. Letting you start a couple hours late and you still barely make it. You gonna fire me for not being early? Don't think I haven't thought about it. They tell me I'm going easy on you, you know. Well, fire them then. You know I do enough. Yeah, well, don't think I haven't thought about that either. All right, same as yesterday. You know what to do. Come back by at lunch. I told your mom I'd take you out. Andy opened the door for his dad as they entered a small bar off the highway. They sat down at a booth opposite the bar. A blonde woman in her late 30s walked up to the booth and laid down a couple of menus. Drinking today, Mike? Nah, I gotta go back to work. A uh, couple of Cokes? Mike said, motioning toward Andy with a question on his face. Andy shrugged. All right, I'll go grab those. Let you look at the menu. The waitress walked towards the back. Anyway, what's the occasion, Mike? Andy said to his dad, wearing an exaggerated smug look. First off, she's a waitress. They're supposed to be friendly. Secondly, Mike hesitated to continue, but pushed on. You've been a pretty big bummer lately, man. What's up with you? Are you serious? Andy replied shortly. Yeah, I'm serious. Look, I know shit isn't exactly going how you planned it, but how long did you really think it was going to last? You lost more money than you ever made, and I think... Look, I think it was really great life experience you got to have for a while, but... You're not too far away from 30 now, kid. You gotta grow up. Grow up in what? Work two jobs for the rest of my life? I already told you, that's just for the summer if you wanted to stay with us. Fine, whatever, then I what? Work at a gas station for the rest of my life? Not for the rest of your life. The waitress set down the Cokes quickly, but reading the situation a little late, stepped away before asking if they were ready to order. Not for the rest of your life, Mike continued a bit less heated, but for a little while. We'll help you find something better to do. It just might take a little bit. Like what, running a landscaping company? Andy replied, barely holding back his welling, and not particularly age-appropriate teenage angst. I mean, if you actually wanted to, but no, something you might not hate. Maybe you won't love it, but something you don't hate. A lot of somethings in some days. That's life, kid. Four. Some of the blood and a little bit of skull with some attached brain matter landed on the counter in front of Andy. Without thinking, he grabbed a napkin from the dispenser near him and wiped it away into the trash can beneath the counter. Would you look at that? Not even phased. What a pro. You must have seen this before. Hell, maybe you've done this before. Andy stood there and blinked in what felt like slow motion. He looked at the man as if he were looking at an incoming car. His mind raced as if in some foreign language. What? said Andy. I said, the man spoke louder. 
you must have seen this kind of thing, and or done this kind of thing before, as you seem to be taking it pretty well. Uh, I've never seen anyone killed before, sir. Sir. Mm, yeah, I like that. Yeah, call me Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox chuckled a bit and went over to the door. He turned the key in the upper corner from automatic to off and turned the lock on the inner door. Mr. Fox continued, You must be a natural, then. A uh, natural what? Andy looked a bit pale and leaned onto the counter. A natural killer. Andy threw up into the trash can beneath the counter. Hm. Well, never mind. Still, maybe I can make you work anyway. You see, most people are naturally violent. People like you and me, well, we were born with a moral core. You look like you still got yours, unless you just puked it out. My mama, well, my mama beat mine out of me. Beat me half to death. Beat me to death, I think. Hit me upside the head with a baseball bat. Ever since then, me and God have been real close. He told me, he did, that humanity is a violent breed, and he sent me back down here to punish your wickedness as I see fit. Ever since then, I've been a ghost, you see. A ghost sent down here to haunt you bastards. You're, you're a ghost? Damn, you really are turning out to be a fucking disappointment. You're not particularly bright, are you? Not an asker of insightful questions. Certainly not an answer of one. Yes, a fucking ghost. A ghost because people can't keep their nasty hands to themselves. Like that asshole on the floor. He lunged at me. You saw it. He came after me, and then he still died scared, despite of what he said. There was a knock at the door. Mr. Fox walked over and saw an old lady waving angrily. He shooed her with his hand, but she kept pointing inside the store and then at the sign that posted the store hours. Mr. Fox raised his gun towards the old lady and fired, missing her just barely as she turned and ran back toward the car. Now, where was I? Mr. Fox continued as he walked back towards the counter, kicking Richard's dead body on the way over. Mr. Fox looked around. Well, in Rome, tell me, kid, what's the best thing in here? The, at the door? Andy said shakily. All right, now you're getting it. Not what I wanted, kid, but good try. No, 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 no. Best food, candy, chips, that kind of junk. Uh, the red sour whatever? Andy said, pointing to a brightly colored display of neon yellow packages. Mr. Fox grabbed a bag off the top and tore it open, spilling sugar and citric acid onto the already sticky floor. He grabbed a handful and tossed them in his mouth, chewing with an exaggerated jubilance. He set the candy on the counter and nodded approvingly towards Andy. Good choice. Fantastic manufactured chemical sugar bullshit. For a people so terrified of death, we sure do love doing things that rush us towards it. This store is fucking full of them. Cigarettes, liquor, fat, sugar, processed meat, goddamn lotto tickets. Oh, America, what fucking wonders you provide. Slow deaths, most of them. Maybe so slow people don't notice. Bunch of cowards. Afraid of getting it over with. Mr. Fox sighed and looked around, perhaps a bit bored. Tell you what. Empty the register, print me some lottery tickets, and let's get on with this thing. Andy got to work putting bills in a bag and hitting the buttons with the highest numerical value on the lottery machine. Print me a winning number, Mr. Fox said sarcastically. I'm sure you get assholes like that all the time. Fucking posers, man. A real gambler wants to lose. It's an act of self-sabotage. You ever see someone win big and walk away? Uh, yeah, Andy said sheepishly. Yeah, well, sure, whatever, but not a real gambler. They'll put all the winnings back into the pot. They don't want to end up ahead. A real gambler? Mr. Fox was interrupted by the sound of police sirens. That wasn't you, kid, was it? Mr. Fox said jokingly and pointed the gun towards Andy. Just kidding. I know it was that old bat. Mr. Fox put his elbow on the counter and then put his chin under the gun, bobbing his head in an exaggerated motion to signal thinking. You a gambler, kid? Mr. Fox stood back up with his hand and the gun on the counter. Uh, no, not really. Well, doesn't matter. That other asshole, when he tried to stop me, the odds weren't in his favor. Now, like you said, you're not a gambler, so I'll put the odds in your favor. Mr. Fox placed the gun on the counter and pushed it so that it sat closer to Andy, with the handle pointed towards him, the barrel towards Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox smiled slyly and put his hands above his shoulders. Go. The immediate crack of a gunshot reverberated through the gas station. 